what a blessing. What a blessing to be able to all be together um, with the technology, as was mentioned in the opening prayer. We are very, very blessed because we're so scattered. And uh, where there's so much, I think it was also mentioned in the opening prayer, the chaos that's out there. Uh, it's everywhere. So it's a really a blessing to have this technology connect with all of you, even in troublesome times. Now, I know the challenges around the world continue, even with post-COVID, with economic and political challenges that are continuing, particularly uh, for those of you right now in Sri Lanka. It seems like for more than two years, the focus of the world has been so intense that, that everyone's been focusing on the catastrophe of COVID-19 pandemic. And the economic devastation has definitely been out there in many countries around the world. And it has been significant. And it has affected human lives. It's affected human livelihoods with almost uh, complete or partial or even full lockdowns in many countries resulting in a situation as if we were under house arrest in our own country. And then, of course, most of you know that afterwards Russia invaded Ukraine. In fact, both of those issues, both of those problems have been intense and have been damaging, and they've caused inflationary pressures uh, with some of the products that come from that part of the world. And surprisingly, both of those incidences of the pandemic is still going on, and so, of course, is the war between Russia and Ukraine. So many, many countries have experienced economic challenges, but at present, no country seems to be hit as hard as Sri Lanka. Those of you in Sri Lanka, not only have you had the economic woes, but you also have the political unrest and the social unrest and, and the inflation and all of those things. So it seems like it's been magnified really uh, to an unprecedented level, not only because of COVID-19, which of course affected uh, tourism, which is a significant gross national product there in Sri Lanka. It affected tourism greatly, just uh, it was cat catastrophic. It ruined the tourism industry. And also because of many other factors, uh, the dwindling Sri Lanka exports, the inability uh, for Sri Lanka to have cash reserves to purchase needed import items such as petrol, such as diesel. And all of these things have exploded. Uh, it's been the perfect storm in a bad way into several major issues in that country. Massive unemployment, the power crisis, the skyrocketing inflation, the higher food and energy costs, the lack of certain things, the food, the inability to purchase petrol, or it being in extremely long queues, if you indeed can get it at all. So a lot of uncertainty, a lot of chaos, and of course, the mismanagement of the Sri, Lan Sri Lankan governmental leaders over the last few years. So all of this has taken a toll socially, politically, and economically. And some of you in Sri Lanka have told me that you have begun facing hardships uh, that you have never had before in your lifetime and you have never seen in your country's history. And yet at the same time, some of you have told me that God has taken care of the brethren here, that he has seen us through, and that there are no serious issues to report for the time being, that the brethren are in reasonably good health even though medical care is in jeopardy and operations are in jeopardy, medical supplies are in jeopardy, and yet are in reasonably good health and spiritually strong overall. So that's inspiring to me. Um, even though you're going through common hardships and common uh, economic difficulties that are common to all of you. So we certainly want to make sure we thank God for that. And let's continue to look to God for his continued love, his mercy, his comfort, his provisions that he makes, regardless of the trials that we go through, his promise is to never leave nor never forsake. And, and how he does that, I don't necessarily know, but he has the power to do that. And he is God. And I think many of you in Sri Lanka are seeing how he's taking care of your needs during a very difficult time. So um, let's continue to thank and praise God for taking such good care of us. Before I forget, I also want to pass on greetings. Uh, there are many in my country that are wanting to make sure that you know that they're thinking about you. They pass on their greetings, and they're also letting you know that they are praying for some of the things that you're going through. So I wanted to make sure that I took care of that. Also, before I get into the sermon message, I want to echo what Mr. Frank Reckerman mentioned to the Agra 
excuse me, uh, to the Colombo Sri Lanka congregation. Uh, going to be some special, uh, a special meeting coming up this Sunday, the 31st of July. So hopefully you can all be there. Uh, I'll be involved as well, either personally at the meeting or connected by Zoom. Uh, many things to discuss as we move forward in registering the church uh, uh, in Sri Lanka and also beginning to establish a national council. So I uh, want to encourage as many of you as possible to be there uh, at that particular meeting. All right, the title of the sermon uh, this Sabbath today, it's a long one, but I think it encompasses really what I want to cover today, and I think it's an important message. The title of the message is Evidence That Demands a Verdict, The Case for Jesus as the Christ. So it's a long title, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, The Case, The Legal Case, I guess you could say, or The Biblical Case, for Jesus as the Christ. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have ever heard of a book entitled The Case for Christ. The Case for Christ. Uh, the book was written uh, by a man by the name of Lee Strobel. And when his wife announced to him that she had become a believer in Jesus Christ, this former Chicago Tribune legal affairs newspaper reporter, and also an avowed atheist, begins to embark on a journey or a quest to investigate the truth about Jesus. Now, he uses his skills as a law school graduate and a longtime journalist, and Strobel begins to interview and occasionally he interrogates an array of scholars that specialize in Christianity and the New Testament. And he was a longtime religious skeptic. He didn't believe in God. He begins the book as an atheist. And by the end, he discovers evidence for Jesus Christ, for his existence, for his divinity, for his resurrection. He finds overwhelming evidence. And by the end of his journey, Strobel realizes his atheism simply does not hold up against the evidence and he takes the next natural step. He becomes a believer that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Savior of all humankind, and he's also the Son of God. But what I found interesting is he comes to this conclusion, perhaps without even realizing it, he comes to this conclusion based on biblical principles of testimony and witnesses. For you see, Testimony and witnesses are biblical principles, and they are found throughout the scripture, and God uses testimony and witnesses to establish the truth. Let's turn to John chapter 5 and verse number 30. John chapter 5 and verse number 30, that's our first scripture today, and Jesus says something remarkable here. So let's begin with this particular, we're going to focus on verse 31, but let's pick up some of the context in verse number 30. Jesus says this, he says, I can of myself do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I don't seek my own will, but I seek the will of the Father who sent me. But notice what he says in verse number 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, what's he trying to get at here? Isn't this interesting? Jesus said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, he didn't mean that if he bore witness of himself that he would be lying. What he meant was that if he bore witness of himself, even though it was true, it would not in a legal sense establish the truth. In other words, you cannot establish the truth by bearing witness about yourself. You have to have independent witnesses. Jesus could just not unilaterally come into the world and tell the world, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the deliverer. I am the savior of all humankind. Even though that could be true, it would not in a legal sense and in a biblical sense, it would not establish the truth. So this principle is not only true in a court of law in most countries, 
it is also a godly principle. God understands the importance of testimony and witnesses to establish the truth. And this we shall see in the scriptures. And we shall also see today that this has ramifications for you and for me. Now, in my country, in the United States today, although to a lesser extent than previously, it understands the importance of testimony and witnesses in a legal proceeding in order to establish the truth. But remarkably, my country and many other countries of the world got this principle from the scriptures. They got this principle from God. And there's a revealing incident in the book of Acts that I think begins to underline the importance of testimony and witnesses. So let's notice that in the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 1 and verse number 15. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 15. Because this is one of the first items of business that the apostles had to conduct after the ascension of Jesus Christ, after he had returned to heaven. And while they were waiting in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit, one of the first acts that they do is to assure that they have 12 witnesses. Let's read what it says. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 15. It says, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And he said, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. So we're talking about the one that betrayed Christ, Judas, who had become a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us, and he obtained a part of this ministry. But now let's drop down to verse number 21. It says, therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So it's going all the way back to Jesus's baptism and from the time that he called his disciples and then was carrying on his ministry for three and a half years and then his crucifixion and then his death and then his resurrection. Among those men that had been with them through all of that time, notice verse 22, from the beginning of the baptism of John to that day when Jesus was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness of his resurrection. Now that's interesting. It seems that there had to be 12 witnesses, not 11, not 13, but 12 specific witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And not only of the resurrection, because they wanted those witnesses to go all the way back to his baptism and through his ministry and through his death and then resurrection. They wanted a complete record of Jesus' ministry from 12 witnesses, people who saw it, people who heard it. Now, let's go over to Numbers chapter 35 and verse number 30. Numbers chapter 35 and verse number 30, because the idea of testimony and witnesses to provide evidence of the truth is a powerful and reoccurring theme in the Bible, and we run into it again and again and again, and perhaps we've not noticed it before because we've not looked for it, but it is powerful, and it is reoccurring, and it is important to us as we will see. So this idea of testimony and witnesses is expressed also here in Numbers chapter 35 and verse number 30. Let's read it. It says, whoever kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the testimony of witnesses. But one witness is not sufficient testimony against a person for the death penalty. Now, that's pretty easy to see why that is so, because one witness could have been the killer himself. And he could have said, well, you see that other person over there? They're the one that killed him. I saw him. Mr. A over there is the one that killed this man. And so that wouldn't be justice. And so you cannot put anyone to death with one witness, because that could have been the killer himself. You have to have more than one witness. Now, let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. Let's also notice something there. In Deuteronomy chapter 17 
in verse number six, again, talking about witnesses, the importance of witnesses. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse six. It says, whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. So notice the words testimony and witness. They may seem like only legal terms, but they are godly principles. There is a very great doubt, frankly, in, in, in many countries of the world, whether you could be convicted of circumstantial evidence under God's system. Because if you don't have more than one witness, you cannot be put to death. Now, the idea of witnesses and testimony continues. Let's go over to Deuteronomy. We're here in Deuteronomy 17. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a tickle in my throat, and that's going to cause me some problems this morning. But let's go over to Deuteronomy chapter 5, and let's pick it up here in verse number 20. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 20. It says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, this is part of the Ten Commandments. This one's the Ninth Commandment. Notice the importance that God makes of witnesses. It is one of the Ten Commandments. And notice the importance he places on not being a false witness. This is so important to God that this is one of the Ten Commandments. And now let's go to a New Testament reference. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. And now here the Apostle Paul is in reference to some of the conflicts that are going on at the church of Corinth, he says something here about witnesses. Let's notice. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. He says, this will be the third time that I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So one person's word is not good enough. You need witnesses and you need two or three. And at the end of the age, some of you may know how many witnesses will there be. You know, how many witnesses is God going to send at the end of the age? He talks about that there's going to be two witnesses at the end of the age, when God will deliver an end time message to all of humankind. It's going to be through two witnesses. So this message that he's going to deliver at the end of the age is not going to be through one witness, but two. So coming back to the subject at hand. Why did Jesus just not bear witness himself about himself, that he was the promised Messiah, that he was the promised Christ? Again, as we've already read in John chapter 5, verse 31, he said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Again, not that he'd be lying, but it wouldn't establish the truth, not only in a legal sense, but in a biblical sense because it's a biblical principle. So Jesus' witness about himself alone would not be enough to establish this truth. It would have to be established by the testimony of several witnesses. So not only are testimony and witnesses important, again, in a court of law, in my country, your country, most countries around the world, but the Bible reveals, and God himself stresses, the importance of testimony and witnesses to establish the truth. Now, let's take a look at a few examples of testimony and witnesses and bearing witness in the scriptures. Let's turn to John chapter 1 and verse number 16. John chapter 1 and verse number 16. And we're going to see terms here that we normally think of just as legal terms. We're going to see testimony. We're going to be seeing witnesses. We're going to see the phrase bearing witness. And yet we will see again that these are godly principles. And again, that they have important implications for us. And as we begin at looking at these terms, let's notice how many times we see them in the scripture. So let's begin with this first example. It has to do with John the Baptist. Many of you are familiar with him. John chapter 1, verse 16. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We're talking about John the Baptist. Verse number seven. This man, notice, came for a witness. 
a to bear witness of the light. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> he was going to bear witness of somebody else who was going to be a light. And why? That all through him, all through this light, that all through him might believe. Now, John was not that light, verse 8, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which is going to come into the world that gives light to every man coming into the world. Wow. He was going to bear witness about someone that was very important, who was going to bring light into a dark world, who was going to bring light to every human being in the world. Let's drop down to verse number 15. John bore witness of him. Who is him? We'll see in a moment. He's bearing witness of a man by the name of Jesus. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, John's testimony continues as we drop down to verse number 19 of John chapter 1. Now, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests, and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Because John was becoming very well known. He was preaching about a message of repentance. He was baptizing people. And because of the 70 weeks prophecy in the book of Daniel, many people were expecting the Messiah. In fact, it was time for the Messiah, according to that prophecy in the first century to appear. And they thought that John the Baptist was the Christ. So they asked him in verse 19, John, who are you? And he confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, well, then, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. And then they said to him, well, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? So again, whatever you say about yourself has no legal standing but they're still asking anyway. And so John has to tell the truth because that's also part of the ninth commandment. So he tells them the truth when he says, when they ask him, who are you? He tells them in verse 23, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. John is basically saying, I am fulfilling this prophecy of Isaiah. I am making the way for the Christ to be known. Verse 24, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, well, then why do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered, and he said, I baptize with water, but notice what he's about to testify, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. He says, there's somebody in your midst right now whom you do not know, Verse 27, it is he who is coming after me, who is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He's beginning to introduce the Christ. And who is the Christ? Who is he saying is the Christ? Who is he testifying that is the Christ? Well, we'll see as we read on. It comes up pretty fast because it comes up in verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus. A specific person, Jesus of Nazareth. That next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said to, the, to his disciples that were in his, in his company, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, that's quite a testimony. Here's a man by the name of Jesus that John is saying, that this is the lamb that's going to take the sin away of the whole world. Now, if there would have been any Jewish religious leaders listening to John's comment, that would have been blasphemous to, re to the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders of that time, because they believed that no man could take away the sin of the world. And here's John testifying when he sees Jesus coming towards him, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's go on to verse number 30. This is he, this Jesus, the one that he's referring to, 
that one that he's talking about. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who was preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know who he would be, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness. Again, he's talking to people. I'm bearing witness that I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remained upon him. He's referring to Jesus. I did not know he would be who he would be, verse 33. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remain on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And John says in verse 34, and I have seen, I saw, when I baptized Jesus, I saw this image of a dove, the Holy Spirit, coming down on this Jesus and remaining on him. I have seen and I testify that this is the Lamb. So man is not only the light, this man is not only the light that was going to come into the world, not only the one that is the one that's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit, not only is he the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the world, but John testifies, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Wow. That's heavy stuff. And John the Baptist knows the ninth commandment, that he is not supposed to be bearing false witness. Now, John the Baptist bears further witness over in John chapter 3. So let's go to John chapter 3 and verse number 26. John chapter 3 and verse number 26. A couple of chapters over. It says, then they came to John the Baptist, and they said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, referring to Jesus, to whom you have testified, behold, now he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered, and he said, a man can receive nothing unless it is given to him from heaven. Now John testifies that what has been given to Jesus was given to him from above, from heaven. Let's read on, verse number 28. It goes on to say, And you yourselves bear me witness that I said that I am not the Christ, but that I have been sent before him. So God has inspired John the Baptist to prepare the way for the Christ in the first century. So the true Messiah, the true Christ, would come on the scene in the first century. And John came on the scene in the first century as well to prepare the way for the Messiah. And all other false Christs from any other period of time are just that. They are false Christs. Between the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel that said the Messiah would come on the scene in the first century, and then John the Baptist testifying that he was going to prepare the way for the Messiah in the first century, and then getting specific to a person by the name of Jesus. Let's read on in verse 28 here. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So also John bears witness that he is not the Christ, but that Jesus is. So again, this is heavy stuff. This is heavy testimony. He goes on in verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He, referring to Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. And notice verse 31, what John testifies here. He who comes from above is above all. So John is now testifying where this man Jesus comes from, that he comes from above. And that's quite heavy testimony as well. He continues in verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthy and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, he testifies. And yet, no one 
receives his testimony. <clears throat> so John is now testifying where this man Jesus comes from, that he comes from above. <clears throat> he comes from heaven. And somehow he knows that Jesus' testimony is not going to be received. Jesus is going to testify what he knows, what he has seen, and what he has heard. And yet somehow John knows that very few are going to receive Jesus' testimony. Now, John's testimony continues in verse number 33. He who receives his testimony, referring to Jesus's, has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure to him. So John the Baptist, if we review, he has testified several things about this man, Jesus, here in John chapter 3. Number one, that what Jesus has been given has come from above. It's come from heaven. We saw that in verse number 27. John further says that Jesus comes from heaven. We see that in verse number 31. Jesus himself testifies what he has seen and heard. We see that in verse number 32. And we see also John testifies that Jesus has been sent. He's been sent by God. We see that in verse number 34. We see further, John testifies that Jesus speaks the words of God. He doesn't speak his own words. He speaks the words of God. That's also in verse number 34. And God does not give the Spirit by measure to Jesus. He gives a full measure. It's not a partial, but it's not by measure, it's full. And that also is testified by John in verse number 34. But John's not done. He continues to testify further in verses 35 and verse number 36. Let's read those. It says, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, this is really strong testimony. This is strong stuff, and it has ramifications for us as we read it here in verse number 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Now the testimony is here that we have to believe in this Jesus, this Son of God, in order to have everlasting life. And it goes on to say, he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the, John the Baptist strongly testifies that he who believes in Jesus, this Son, has everlasting life. Again, this would be blasphemous to the Jewish religious authorities. They, they would not say that you would not believe in any human being, any man, Jesus, in order to have everlasting life. If they were listening to John the Baptist, John the Baptist would have been in trouble because of what he's testifying. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. So this is strong testimony here. Let's now go over to turn over to John chapter 5, just a couple of chapters over. John chapter 5 and verse number 31. John chapter 5 and verse 31. Remember, Jesus said here, we've already actually read the scripture, but we're going to read the next one, but in the same in this context. But let's read verse 31 again. Jesus says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. It's not valid in a legal sense. It's not valid even according to biblical principles. But he says in verse 32, there is another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. And he's talking about John the Baptist here. Let's read on in this context of John 5 verse 33. He says, he's talking to the Jewish religious leaders. He says, you have sent to John. You sent to John the Baptist earlier. And he told you, I'm not the Christ, but that there was someone standing in your midst that you do not know who is the Christ, is what John was telling them. Let's go on to verse number 33. 
you have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet Jesus says, I don't receive testimony from man. Jesus said, yes, John is testifying for me, but there's other test, testi testifying that go on uh, witnessing for me as well, besides John. Yet I do not receive, verse 34, testi testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. So he's basically saying, hey, look, you have to believe in me to be saved. Referring in verse 35 to John, he was burning a shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. So again, John the Baptist bore witness of Jesus that he was the Messiah. He was the Christ. But notice in verse 36 that there is a greater witness than John's. Verse number 36, let's read it together. Jesus is speaking, but I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So the works that Jesus was doing, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, those were bearing witness that Jesus was the Messiah that was sent from God. Keep your hand or your marker here in John, but let's turn over to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read beginning in verse number 22. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 22. And now we have the apostle Peter speaking. And I guess you could say also testifying. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 22. This is on the, the day of Pentecost. And Peter is, is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, that's pretty specific, isn't it? He's talking about a specific Jesus, a specific person, Jesus, and this is where he came from, of Nazareth. Very specific. A man attested by God. Now, attested means that God is giving formal confirmation formal endorsement. So men of Israel, verse 22, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God, confirmed by God, endorsed by God, by God himself, to you. How? Notice, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Jesus, or, or Peter, is actually saying, you saw these miracles, signs, and wonders, too. You, too, then, have become eyewitnesses of these things, that Jesus did these works. He performed these miracles, these wonders, these signs, and God did them through this man, Jesus. And so we see here that these works themselves bear witness that this man, Jesus is the Christ. Now let's go back to John. We were in John chapter 5, but this time let's go back to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up here in verse number 24. John chapter 10 and verse number 24. And now we've got these Jewish religious leaders that are surrounding him and others that are surrounding him too that are Jews. It says, then the Jews surrounded him and they said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you, Jesus, are the Christ, if you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, John the Baptist had already told them, and the works had already told them, and the Father, God, had already attested. Jesus answered them, and he said, I have told you, and you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me but you don't believe because you are not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now ramifications for us? Yes, absolutely. This Jesus is a rabbi and he is a shepherd like David was, but a different kind of shepherd. He has sheep that he knows. And how does he know them? They follow him. They imitate him. They strive to live like him. They strive to be like him. 
in every way as a disciple of this rabbi. Now, if Jesus is the Christ, then that has implications. That has ramifications for all of humankind because he says, listen to my teaching, follow me, follow my example. So the works, the wonders, the miracles, the signs bear witness that Jesus is the Christ. God the Father also bears witness to, to Jesus being the Christ. And let's look at that. Let's, let's go back now to John chapter 5 and verse number 37. It's not only John the Baptist. It's not only the works, but also God the Father himself. So John chapter 5 and verse number 37. Let's pick it up there. John chapter 5, verse 37, and Jesus is speaking here. He says, and the Father himself who sent me, he has testified of me that you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him, you do not believe. So that's pretty powerful. Jesus is testifying of the things that he knows of the things that he sees and he's heard. And he said, the father has bore witness of me because he's working these works through me. And yet you don't have his word abiding in you as ramifications for them. You don't have his word abiding in you because whom he has sent, you do not believe. And so that is serious business and having ramifications for them. Let's continue to read here in verse number 39. You search the scriptures. Now we're going to see that the scriptures bear witness of Jesus Christ, that he is the Christ. You search the scriptures, verse 39, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these scriptures are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. You know, there's another scripture that God the Father sent Jesus Christ and said that Jesus is the way, the life, and the truth. God has sent his son to show the way, and to show and to bring life, eternal life to us, and show us what the truth is. Jesus is used very much by God the Father. <coughs> but not only that, but the scriptures testify that Jesus is the Christ. Verse 41, I do not receive honor for men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. He's calling a spade a spade. I have come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe you who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes only from God? Verse 45, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. Now, as we go on to verse number 46, we see that Moses bears witness of Jesus being the Christ. It's a written witness, but a witness nonetheless. Verse 46, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Now, that's written testimony. But if you do not believe his writings, then how will you believe my words? So Jesus does not bear witness of himself. He does testify the truth when he's asked, but others bear witness about him that he is the Messiah. So who or what has testified so far of what we've covered that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ? Well, we've seen John the Baptist has testified and borne witness. We see the works that Jesus performed, the miracles, the signs, the wonders. They bear witness that he is the Christ. The Father bears witness that Jesus is the Messiah. And the scriptures bear witness that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, let's also notice that the Apostle John bears witness that this man, Jesus, is the Messiah. Let's notice that in John chapter 20 and verse number 30. John chapter 20 and verse number 30. Let's turn over there. We haven't heard John is one of the 12. We haven't heard from him yet, but he bears witness 
that Jesus is the Christ. Let's notice here. John chapter 20, we'll read verses 30 and 31. It says, and truly Jesus did, Jesus, we're talking about a specific person, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. There were many signs and wonders, but they weren't all recorded. But notice verse 31, but the ones that are written in the book are written that you may believe, notice, that Jesus is the Christ. Now, often a lot of people, let's talk about the word Christ for a moment. I should have covered this earlier. <clears throat> a lot of people think that that's his last name. Nothing could be further from the truth. Christ is a title. Christ and Messiah are equivalent. They mean the same thing. And it's a title that means the deliverer, the savior of all mankind, the anointed one to deliver and save the anointed one from God the Father. It is a title, and it has powerful meaning. And now the Messiah had been promised for generations, and now on the first century, a man by the name of Jesus comes on the scene, and we have all of this testimony and all of these witnesses that this man, Jesus, is the anointed one. He is the Christ. He is the deliverer. He is the Savior of all humankind. He has the ability to bear the sins of the whole world. And so this is a remarkable testimony here. So John says, verse 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and further, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. This man, Jesus, is the Christ, is the testimony here. All right, let's go further. Notice that the, um, that the Apostle Paul bears witness that this man, Jesus, is the Christ. Let's go over to the book of Acts chapter 9 and verse number 22. Acts chapter 9 and verse number 22. Now, Paul, of course, was raised in the Jewish faith, and he became a Christian. And his name was changed eventually from Saul to Paul. But notice here what it says, what he's testifying here. So it says in Acts chapter 9, verse 22, But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So he was beginning to share what testifying and from the scriptures, bearing witness that Jesus is the Christ. Notice also in Acts chapter 18 and verse 5. Let's go over there. Paul says it again in a different context. Acts chapter 18 and verse number 5. Acts 18, verse number 5. Let's read it together. It says, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit, and he testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So we have all of these people. We've got John the Baptist. We've got the Apostle John. We've got the Apostle Paul. We've got the 11. We've got all of these different testimonies here. Let's continue to read on here for in Acts chapter 18. Let's go on to verse number 28. <clears throat> Acts 18, verse 28, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, so other people were also listening, publicly showing from the scriptures, because remember, the scriptures also show that Jesus is the Christ. So it's remarkable here. Now, there are others who testify that this Jesus is the Christ. Let's go over, go over to Luke chapter 2 and verse number 1. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2 and verse number 1. God has witness after witness after witness. So let's notice here, and this is in the context, a pretty familiar section of scripture that, uh, that talks about the birth of Jesus. But let's notice in the context of the message today, uh, what we can derive from this section of scripture. The birth of Jesus, it came to pass, Luke chapter 2, verse 1, in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, uh, Syria. 
So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Now, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth. Remember, Jesus of Nazareth was the man, that specific man that is the Christ. Out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for Mary to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. <coughs> Excuse me. So a pretty familiar story about the birth of Jesus. But let's notice what happens next in verse number eight. Remember the story of the shepherds and the angels. Now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Imagine the scene. Imagine being in their shoes. There was an angel of the Lord that stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were greatly afraid. You know, it got their attention. This glory must have been something. And so they were afraid, greatly afraid. Verse 10, and the angel said to them, don't be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news, good tidings, <coughs> excuse me, of great joy, which shall be to all people. So whoever this one that this angel is talking about, it's good news, great joy for all people, not just the Israelites, but all people of all the world. Verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the first century, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ. So Christ was going to be born at this time in the first century, as a baby, the Messiah was going to be an infant, to start out of as an infant. But also notice, who is Christ the Lord? So now this Jesus takes on more than the title of Christ, but also of Lord. Verse 12, and this will be a sign to you. This will be a testimony. This is proof. This is evidence. You're going to bear witness of this to others. This is a sign to you. You're going to find a baby that's wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with that angel a multitude of angels, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Verse 15, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this sign with our own eyes. Let's see this thing that has come to pass, which God or the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste. You can imagine they ran and they found Mary and Joseph and this babe that was born, that was to be known as the Christ and also the Lord. They saw this babe, verse 16, lying in a manger, and when they had seen him with his own eyes, then they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. So they bore witness that this child is the Christ. They bore witness of everything that happened, of the angel that appeared to them, that told them to go into this town, that you would find a babe that was lying in the manger, and that this babe would be the Christ, the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Savior of all humankind. Let's continue to read verse 18. And then those who heard their testimony, those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary, Jesus' mother kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You can imagine being the mother of this little infant. And then the shepherds returned. They glorified. They praised God for all the things that they had heard and all the things that they had seen. They were eyewitnesses, all the things that were told to them. And notice verse 21. And when the eight days were completed for the circumcision of this child, his name was called Jesus the name that was given by the angel before he was even conceived 
in the womb. Wow. God is working through many, through testimony and witnesses. <clears throat> but we're not done. Let's notice what happens next in verse number 22. Now, when the days of Mary's purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And in verse 25, let's jump there. We see a man by the name of Simeon bearing witness. Let's notice. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem, verse 25, whose name was Simeon. And this man was a just, he was a devout man, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. God was working with this man. And it had been revealed to him, verse 26, by the Holy Spirit that this man would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he was going to see the Messiah with his eyes before he died. So again, this is the first century. The true Christ is in the first century. And this man was going to see the true Christ. Verse 27. So he came by the spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, specific man or his babe at this point, to do for him according to the custom of the law. He took him, Jesus, up in his arms. He blessed God and he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. Now, God is inspiring Simeon here to make this testimony before all peoples. You know, the Jews th thought that, you know, the Messiah was coming just for them, for the Israelites. But God is revealing to Simeon as he's moved by the Holy Spirit and he sees this infant who is the Christ. He begins to be inspired and says, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, including the Gentiles, not just the Jews. And notice verse 32, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. All of humankind is involved and the glory of your people, Israel. Verse 33, and Joseph and his mother marveled. You can imagine being in their shoes. They marveled at those things which were spoken of their son. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child, Jesus, is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through his own soul also. Wow, God's Holy Spirit is inspiring that this child is going to have a sword that's going to be piercing through his soul. And that, the, and, and that is being done in order that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Now let's go to verse 36. We're not done yet. We see another person bearing witness. A, a woman by the name of Anna bears witness. Verse 36, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. And she was of great age. And she had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple. So even though she'd lost her husband, she was still serving God with fastings and prayers night and day. And notice coming into that very instant that Simeon is holding this infant in his, in his arms and saying that this is the Christ. Coming in in that instant, she gives thanks to the Lord. And she spoke of him referring to this infant to all of those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So, so, so now she's bearing witness of what she has seen and what she has heard. Brethren, God understood the importance of having several witnesses, didn't he? In order to establish the truth of who is the Christ and of what he taught and of what he said and of the works and of the miracles that he did, they all bore witness of who his son is, of who his Messiah is. God understands. <clears throat> now, on this topic of witnesses and testimony in the Bible, have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't write his own book? You know, why do we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John as the four Gospels, but no gospel according to Jesus? I mean, Jesus could have sat down, written out his message. He could have got it absolutely right. And then we wouldn't have had any questions, right? 
So again, the question, why didn't Jesus write his own book? Now, you may be ahead of me, but perhaps I can give an example to help us understand why God did it this way, why we can understand this concept more fully. Imagine for a moment that you're sitting on a jury in your country. You're hearing a legal case, and a lawyer or an attorney has put a man on the witness stand to tell you his story. And he asks the man, now would you please tell the members of the jury where you were and what you were doing at 11 o'clock in the morning on July 23rd? And the man tells you a story. He seems honest, his story seems reasonable, but you actually have no frame or reference to know whether he's telling you the truth or not. The problem is his story is rather self-serving. He has every reason to tell you his story this way. And although you may want to believe him, you really have no way to know for sure that what he is telling you is true. Now, again, you're sitting on the jury. Suppose instead of that, so put that aside, instead of that, the attorney has put now a succession of four different witnesses on the stand, one after another. Four different witnesses. And all of them tell you roughly the same thing about what that man was doing at 11 o'clock in the morning on July 23rd, because they saw him doing it, and they heard the words that he said. Now, which of these two scenarios are you more likely to believe? Well, you're far more likely to believe the witnesses. You've got four of them who tell you what he was doing, where he was standing at that hour, or what his actions were, or what he was telling people. So consequently, you can have some reasonable assurance that that is actually what took place. So we have, as a part of the New Testament, we have the testimony and witnesses of four different gospel messages, four different gospel accounts, where there are two or three eyewitnesses of what was seen or heard or observed or what was taught. And one of them was an historical account by a contemporary whose name was Luke, the physician. Now, Luke, in a way, was like an investigative reporter who, uh, while all the people who were alive who actually experienced these things with, with Jesus or saw or heard what he taught, he goes out and he talks to each of them and he gathers all the information from the eyewitnesses and then he writes down his, his account like an investigative reporter. Now, God is a God of justice and he is going to make sure that he establishes the truth through several witnesses and through their testimony. It's really a remarkable aspect of God. It's a biblical principle of witnesses and bearing testimony in order to establish the truth. Now, as we look at the testimony of these four different gospel accounts and these four different witnesses here, we see the style of each one is different. The way they record the words of Jesus is sometimes different. It's not always exactly the same. Sometimes the events are in a different order. Because even in a court of law, if the witnesses testify nearly word for word, they can be accused of collusion, which means they all got together and they got all their stories exactly lined up to say exactly the same thing. But when that happens, Oftentimes, the judge and the jury suspect collusion, which means that they're making some of this up. Now, some of these differences or irregularities in the testimony of the four Gospels actually make them more reliable. Some people think they're less reliable, but just the opposite is true. They become more reliable. In a court of law, if the witnesses say exactly the same thing, they feel it's collusion. But if there's some subtle differences, but they're roughly saying the same thing, that actually makes their witness more credible. So just the opposite is true. Some people think, oh, you know, these four Gospels don't exactly all agree in every single aspect. Well, actually, that makes it more reliable. Now, these things pose no problem if we just take these things at face value. As witnesses, all their accounts are true. They may not be what a 21st century reader may call exactly the same, 
but we, however, don't have copy machines, or they didn't have copy machines, and they didn't have digital recording devices back then. But too much accuracy from the witnesses, even today, is suspect. I mean, if we get these three witnesses on the stand and their stories agree word for word in every detail, then we're going to conclude that their stories are too perfect, and therefore they are suspect and there could be collusion. Well, we can't say that there's collusion with the gospel accounts as they're somewhat different. And that is actually more of a strength in the testimony rather than a weakness. It's more of a strength that these were credible and unpeachable witnesses and that these are things that actually did happen. And the man Jesus really is the Christ. Now, we've touched on the fact that the Father testifies that Jesus is the Messiah and that Jesus is his Son. Let's notice more of that in Matthew chapter 17. Let's go over there, Matthew chapter 17, and we're going to pick it up here in verse number 1. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 17 and verse number 1. Now, it says, after six days, Jesus took some of his disciples. He took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Suddenly, his, his figure changed. His face began to shine like the sun, if you can imagine this. And his clothes became as white as the light. So we have three eyewitnesses seeing this. Verse 17, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Then Peter answered, and he said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly there's a voice that comes out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So the Father is now testifying to three of Jesus' disciples that this Jesus is his beloved Son, and that this Father is well pleased with Jesus, and further, that we are to hear his Son. Now, there's a lot to the phrase, hear him, hear my Son that this father is well pleased and wants you to hear him. Now, hear him means not only that we are to listen to the words that his son says, but hear him actually means to believe, to trust, and to follow the teaching of this son, Jesus. So this is the testimony now from the father. And of course, this has ramifications, doesn't it? It has ramifications for you and me. Listen to my son. Hear, my son. Believe, trust, follow, imitate, my son. All of those thoughts are in that, con con that phrase, hear him. All right, so we've touched on the fact that Jesus himself also testifies and bear witness to what he knows, to what he has seen, to what he has heard. And let's take a look at a couple of examples of that. Let's go over to John chapter 7 and verse number 11. John chapter 7 and verse number 11. Jesus testifies here that the doctrine that he has brought is not his. It is the Father's. Let's read about that here. John chapter 7 and verse number 11. It says, Then the Jews sought him at the feast, and they said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning Jesus. Some said, he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of Jesus for fear of the Jews. Verse 14, now about the middle of the feast, Jesus comes into the temple and teaches. Verse 15, and the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied? So whatever it is that Jesus is sharing... <coughs> People are marveling at what they are hearing. How does he know so much, having never studied? And Jesus answers that in verse 16. He said, my doctrine isn't mine. He said, I'm simply relaying the truth, the doctrine of my father. This isn't mine. I'm simply relaying what he's told me to relay. 
My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. And if anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So if Jesus really is who others are testifying that he is, if he really is the Christ, if he really is the Savior of all mankind, if he really brings the doctrine from the Father, then we need to listen. There's ramifications. We need to listen. We need to hear. We need to trust. We need to obey this doctrine that he is bringing from the Father. Let's also notice in John, let's go back to John chapter 3, talking about what Jesus is testifying of, what he knows, what he has seen, what he has heard. Jesus testifies here to Nicodemus. He testifies to Nicodemus God's truth. Let's notice John chapter 3 and verse number 8. John chapter 3 and verse number 8. Let's go over there just a few chapters back. John chapter 3, verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, Jesus is testifying of things that he knows, things that he has seen, things that he has heard. And he's saying, if you're born of the Spirit, you're just like the wind. You can't see it. But, you know, it says the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and says to him, how can these things be? Jesus said to him, to Nicodemus, are you a teacher in Israel? And you don't know these things. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know. Jesus, John the Baptist those that God has sent, we speak what we know, and we testify what we have seen, but you don't receive our witness. He says, if I've told you earthly things and you're not going to believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And then he goes on to say something pretty remarkable. He says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven and that is the Son of Man. Now, Jesus Christ referred to himself as the Son of Man, so he's indirectly saying he's the only one that has ascended to heaven or come from heaven. And he says more about himself in verse 14. He says, as Moses lift, was lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And he's talking about on the stake being crucified. Verse 15. And notice, and whoever believes in him, the Son of Man, and he's referring to himself in the third person, whoever believes in him should not perish, we're talking about eternal death, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, he's referring to himself in the third person, that whoever believes in the Son, whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have ever lasting life. Now again, <clears throat> we see the ramifications to us here, don't we? We see ramifications to all humankind. God the Father gives testimony that we are to hear his son, to listen to him, to hear him, to obey, and that we are to believe him. And again, belief has a lot more to do with just an intellectual belief. It has to do with trust and faith and obedience. And, and so we see here that there's ramifications of this son. You have to believe in him and what he shares, the teaching that he shares in order to have everlasting life. You have to follow his example. This is huge stuff. And so we see here, he's testifying of what he knows and what his father has told him to speak. Now, I began the message today talking about Lee Strobel, a former atheist a former Chicago Tribune legal affairs reporter who was challenged by his wife to embark on a quest to investigate the truth of Jesus 
as the Christ. And again, remarkably, Lee Strobel used the same principles of testimony and witnesses in order to establish the truth. He used the same biblical principles of testimony and witnesses that we find in scripture that God says is important. You know, I think the earlier analogy of sitting on a jury is appropriate, whether it be Lee Strobel or you or me, as a jury of one, we have to decide for ourselves whether we think the witnesses are telling the truth or not. You know, in a jury trial, we hear from eyewitnesses, expert witnesses who tell us what we can make from the physical evidence. And we do much the very same thing when we study the scriptures. We have the testimony and the eyewitness accounts of John the Baptist, of the 12 apostles, of the apostle Paul, of Simeon, of Anna. We have the works themselves, the miracles, the signs, the wonders that bear witness. And we have the father who bears witness. We have the eyewitness accounts of the, of the gospels of Mark, Luke, John, Matthew. Four affidavits, if you will, the four gospels. And of course, we have the witness of the scriptures, the entirety of the scriptures themselves. So we really have the necessary documents right in front of us, don't we? God has presented the witnesses to you and to me of what is said in the different gospels and through the different eyewitness accounts throughout the scriptures and, and throughout the scriptures themselves, the prophecies that the Messiah would fulfill that were prophesied before he even came on the scene and every single one of them were fulfilled by Jesus, the man Jesus, who is the Christ. So God has presented the arguments. He has brought forth the expert witnesses. Now, all of this can maybe seem daunting at first to you and I, but just like a court case, step by step, brick by brick, brush stroke by brush stroke, a picture begins to emerge of the truth in order for the truth to be established. And after all, it is the truth that we want, isn't it? And we can examine all of this ourselves to determine what did Jesus really say? What did he do? What did he teach? Was he really the Messiah? Was he really the son of God? Did he really bring the words and teachings from the father? Was every word out of his mouth really bearing witness of the truth? Because if all of that's true, then what does he expect from you and me? What are the ramifications for us? What are the ramifications for all of humanity? But in the end, you and I have to decide, don't we? Whether we believe these accounts and their teachings to be true whether we believe that this Jesus is the Christ. There is evidence, and it demands a verdict in the case for Jesus being the Christ. Good to be with all of you. Hope to stick around for a little while to talk with some of you a little bit. And I'll turn it back over to our song leader for now. Thanks for joining us for Sabbath services today.